started out with you, Lord. There have been times my feet have strayed. So busy that I failed to read your holy word and pray. But in my darkest hour, when it seemed that no one cared, while searching for a hand to hold, your hand was always there. When I didn't have my hand in yours, Lord, you had your hand on me. And even though I failed you so, you never turned your back on me. When I thought I was standing all alone, you were there, but I couldn't see when I didn't have my hand in yours, Lord. You had your hand on me Many times I felt forsaken As I struggled day by day The path I traveled on had grown so dark I couldn't find my way And when I cut the To the trials I was going through But I now can see Your hand was guiding me Before I ever reached you Lord, I know when I didn't have my hand in yours, Lord, you had your hand on me. And even though I failed you so, you never turned your back on me. When I thought I was standing, all alone you were there but I couldn't see when I didn't have my hand in yours Lord you had your hand on me when I thought I was standing Well, good evening, everybody. Could you guys hear me? Is it loud and clear? I sure hope so. You know, I'm, I'm sure glad that uh, to see Miss Carol get up there and sing. Praising God, let me tell you. You know, and to see all of you folks, I mean, sold out for the ministry. It, I sit all the way back there on Sunday nights, but when I see all of your faces being here and just having that victory in Christ, praising the Lord, fellowshipping and worshiping on Sundays, I always look forward to this day. Always do. So if you see me smiling, I remember Larry asking me, Where are you? how come you're so happy all the time? 
I said, brother, if you know you're going to heaven, but that'll put a smile on your face. That'll put a smile on your face. So tonight we won't belabor this, though. We will talk about the root of the problem. The root of the problem. R-O-O-T. I'm glad Miss Ruth is not here, because otherwise it would be like the root of the problem. <laughs> She's not here. All right. Miss Ruth is not here, but the root of the problem. I know, and uh, at first when I did this message um, Friday, Thursday, Friday, I ran by Teresa and uh, yesterday, and Teresa and I looked at it and said, Honey, it's a 15-minute message. She looked at me, Dad, they're going to ask you to preach again because it's only 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, Teresa. And, my, and it's funny because I get support from my family. My, my parents are in the front row. We call that the splash zone. We get the preachers, you know, every all that. So it's, it's going to be cool for them as well. But the root of the problem. So i um, got to start by saying this, that I've been reading. It's been in my heart lately, though, about our youth. Our youth has been not just in my heart, but I've been praying and kneeling to God almost every night and uh, begging him. So one of the things that, that uh, Brother Enoch gave me was one of the books of Pastor Mike Ray from uh, Hopeful Baptist in Napa, California. He, he wrote a book about either you're cold, called or crazy is the title of the book. And one of the topics that drew me to the book was a, about roots. About roots. So tonight we're going to deal with our roots, the root of the problem. In Job 19.28 it says this, But ye should say, Why persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you, Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to thank you for your Bible, Lord, the words that are written in it, Lord, that we can know of your thoughts, we can know of your will in our lives. And tonight, Father, as we dissect some of your words and look into the root of our problem, Father, I pray, may you give us an open heart and an open mind. But more importantly, Lord, give us, Lord, the will to do this. And Father, I want to thank you because of, without you, Lord, we can do nothing. Without the Lord Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. Please not just open their hearts and minds, but help me to speak it clearly to them. We love you. I know you love, us. you love us so much more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So back in the Philippines, um, we had a palm tree. And this palm tree was on the side of a little planter by our driveway. And this palm tree grew tall enough. It's not like one of our gigantic palm trees here in California, but it's a, it's a good 20, 30 feet. So this palm tree, even though um, it was good to look at, it was already causing a lot of problems. Some of the dry leaves were already starting to fall off. It was making a mess, okay? And my mom was already noticing it because my mom back then was the one who was cleaning the yard and things like that. So besides the mess, uh, there were also creatures. It's already harboring some creatures. So there's some insects, some spiders. Even one day, my friends and I were playing uh, by our yard, the front yard, and we saw a snake slither through the palm tree. And my friend was like, oh, a snake! So he tried to catch a snake and grabbed it by the tail, pulled it out. But it was already causing a lot of mess, and I don't want to tell you what, what happened to the snake. <laughs> but here's the thing. That tree, that palm tree, was already causing a lot of mess. It was problematic. My mom finally decided, you know what? Let's take the tree down. So, of course, she hired me and my brother, and uh, with a few other manpower and uh, a few of our neighbors, she paid a few of them and says, let's take the tree down. So we had to work from our way up down, and we got it down to the stump. We were very successful, very successful. So we're like, eh, pat in the back, we're, we're good. Time passed, little trees, little palm trees started springing up. And my mom's like, oh no, what's going, what are we going to do with this? This incident or this scenario that I gave to you though is similar to how we as Christians deal with our root problems. When I say that, these, this tree needed to be cut and we did. But the root was never removed. We are surprised when we see little trees spring up. When clearly the manifestation is due to a living root that we never addressed. Now these spiritual root problems that we have will just keep manifesting in the flesh. In the form of surface trees. Now we have to get to the source of the problem. Get to the root of the problem. If there's one thing that I want you to take from this message tonight. And that is to be able to examine our own self. Examine. And look into our the root of our problem. How is it that we don't have victory in Christ? How is it that we have no joy? How is it that we cannot proceed and grow up in Christ? There must be a root, because that is probably the surface tree. Now we have, 
like, like Job said, seeing the root of the matter is found in me. And I think if we keep an open mind knowing that the root of the matter is found in me, then we can probably address the root. Now we have a tendency to just take off the surface tree, just like we did, right? It's, there's just a, but even because it was causing problems, and that's one of the common things that we do, we see the surface tree that's causing problems and we just take it down, but not realize there's something underneath it, and that is a much serious and a much bigger problem, and that is the root. The root causes rottenness. And when I say that, the Bible in Isaiah 5.24 says this, Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall... Ruth, I told you, Ruth will come up in all this. The root shall be as rottenness, and their blossom shall go up as dust, because they have cast away the law of the Lord and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. You know, that's what happened to Israel, and that's what will happen to us if we don't take care of the root. No, but the root, like I said, has a surface tree. So surface tree, there's a root. You know, when, a, when you see a Christian not smiling, right, then there must be an underground root called no joy. Because it's hard to smile. If you're, if, if, you're, if you're joyful, you will not be grimacing, right? You won't be grinning if you have joy in your life. But this Christian has an underground root called allowing Satan to take away his or her joy out of Christianity. Why do we allow Satan that privilege? We shouldn't. Now, what about a Christian who prefers worldly clothing? Well, we know that's a surface tree because we all visibly see it, right? There must be an underground root. It is loving the praise of men. You know, back in the days, I used to work for Disneyland. I worked for Disney back in the day. And uh, every time I go for an interview, I just mention Disneyland. You know, when I was an account, actually, I was Mickey Mouse before I became an account, and now I'm a nurse. <laughs> what a transition. Like, I'm just kidding. I'm too tall for Mickey. You know, too tall for Mickey. I'm 5'7 and 3 quarters. I'm glad I'm 5'7 and 3 quarters. But, but I praise God that there's no height limit for preaching, huh? Man, praise God for that. But here's the thing. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Club 33. It's a buy-in club for, for certain people. And there's a Club 33. It's like behind by New Orleans area. Okay? So this waitress, and I did, did costuming and I did phantasmic. So in the costuming area behind the window... This lady would come up, and she's a Club 33 waitress. And she would tell me, Don, give me a skirt that is really short. I said, I'm sorry, we have regulations here at Disney. It's never like any, not, nothing two inches above the knee. I can't give you anything more. And she says, you don't know. You've got to give it to me. I said, no, I can't give it to you. I stood firm in that regulation. But she was, so I asked, what's, what's the deal with the shorter skirt? And she said, because the men love it. And because the men love it, I get better tips. Yeah. There has to be a money behind it, though. But this lady is an unbeliever. Well, I could understand that from this perspective where I'm standing here today. But you know, we as Christians, we have a higher standard. Amen. We actually have a thing called dressing for the Lord. Amen. Dressing for the Lord. You know, in 2 Corinthians 5.10 says this, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Think about that. No, on it for a little, though, and say, wow, you will stand before our God and answer for things we have done in our body. Hey, so I don't know about you, but that to me is a little, you know, a little heavy. So let's take this thing seriously, though. All right. So that is a surface tree. That is an underground root. How about the person who enjoys ungodly music? How about that? Well, the underground root is rebellion. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, this, it's even called a sin of witchcraft. Witchcraft. Nowadays, there's what we call CCM, right? Now, contemporary Christian music, what we've done is we've actually um, mingled this rock and roll music and put godly words in it and call it worship. If you truly want to worship God, worship God in obedience. We could start there. But what we've done is just like worship, worship, now let's do this, CCM. Worship God in obedience to his word. And I'd like you to read 519, Ephesians 519. It says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It can't get any clearer than that. So that is ungodly music and rebellion. How about this? Pornography. That is a surface tree. 
But nobody sees that, right? Because we all want to hide it. It is actually an, un, an invisible, I was going to say invisible, an invisible surface tree. Because we, people just want to hide those things, right? But what is the underground root? The underground root is a perverted mind in a lustful mind. It's actually going to cause a lot of destruction in our lives, in your life, if you're doing that. How about marriage issues? Oh, I like this. Marriage issues. The underground root is selfishness. It's visible. You know, one, about uh, a week ago, my wife was sitting in front of me. And I'm thinking, what if people think that we were, we were like, we were fighting, you know? She was actually cold, because some of the air is really good, Buzz, so we like it. But she was a little, like, you know, cold, so she had to sit in the front. But marriage issues, the underground root is selfishness. The Bible teaches us, husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. Amen. Wives, submit unto your husband. Not submit your request and honey, do this and say, honey, I want you to do this. No, submit. But we don't want to do that because of selfishness. And that's how marriage issues happen. But how about a Christian who has, who worries a lot? How about this? It's actually the root cause is prayerlessness. Lacking a trust in the Lord. Get to the root of the problem. Otherwise, we will be spending all our new life in Christ taking down surface trees. And that is laborious because they'll keep popping up. Now, I want you to get to the root of the problem. The Bible says to look to Jesus, right? In Hebrews, I love that verse. It's look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. What did our Lord Jesus Christ do? He came down from heaven to earth. Did he eradicate sickness and diseases? No, he did not. He did actually heal people. And we know that these miracles were for a sign to the Jews. Did the Lord, when he came down, did he actually um, eliminate poverty? Well, basically, if you read Matthew 26, 11, it says right there that uh, the poor you will always have with you. He did not come to eliminate poverty. How about eliminating suffering and tribulation? Well, it's in John 16, 33, which he clearly said, in the world you shall have, you shall have tribulation. It's guaranteed. But I like the verse that came after that. It says, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And he has. But here's the thing. Jesus went to the source of our problem. He did not cut down the surface tree. The root of all sickness and poverty and suffering was sin. And sin was the root of all. And Jesus, Jesus Christ took care of all of it on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago. And because he took care of sin, he took care of death at the same time. And that is why in Psalm 116, he can say, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Come home, my son. We see death as something that's a, it is a separation from us. But to the Lord, he's receiving them. Now, because our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior, we can now hope for things eternal and things that are not a temporal. We should not hope for things temporal, but hope for things eternal. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul considered his sufferings and tribulation as a light affliction and but for a moment. Think about that. A light affliction because he's comparing the eternity of hell and saying there's an eternity of hell and damnation, which he knew he deserved, which I know we all deserve. He considers it a light affliction because of what our Lord has done. How about this? But for a moment. Thinking of this life is just but a vapor. Appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. What is a vapor compared to eternity? But like Paul, we too need to learn to focus on things eternal, not temporal. Sin has been dealt with. Death has been dealt with. Sickness, poverty, and suffering is but a light affliction. And for a moment, the Bible even calls us this, says this. Romans 8.37, it says that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I don't know about you, I love the word conquerors. That is you and that is me. I put my name right there and it says, right, Donnie the Conqueror. Like, I love that. You are a conqueror too. But it sounds kind of puny when you say Donnie the Conqueror. It sounds like Donnie and this is Don the Conqueror. Right? I should say that. But that's who we are. And then we go back to this. But what have we conquered? Where have been we victorious in our lives? We can barely conquer our own fears, people. I mean, hey, this was my fear before. I figured if I witness to my boss, my boss will fire me. 
right? And I'm like, Lord, I need a ministry at work. So now I have a boss every three years, and every time the person would leave, I would sit them down and talk to them about the gospel. Conquer your fears. We can't even tell people about Christ. When there's an opportunity, what do we do? We cower at the opportunity. Give the gospel to people. Conquer your fears. We can't even conquer our our own minds and bring it to subjection. How about that? We can't even prioritize Bible reading or studying, supporting church functions. How about this? Being on time. Let's conquer our minds. Mindset. Mind over your body. How about our conquering our own feelings and emotions? We can't even govern our own feelings. We get offended with every little thing that we hear. You know, the Bible says we, are, we ought to be dead to trespasses and sin. So that means we should be dead to, to compliments and at the same time to these complaints. Whatever criticism we get, we should like, I'm dead to that. should not affect us. But if it does, let's look at what is the root of all that. So conquerors, how come we're not? Get to the root of the problem. Brethren, until these roots are plucked up and removed, there can be no real victory in a Christian's life. And the longer the root, the deeper it grows. It sounded like a, 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 a song I used to sing back in the day when I was a... Uh, the, the longer the root, the deeper it grows. There was a study back in the 1930s, and this study showed that if you give a tree the right amount of oxygen, if you give the tree the right amount of water, and the right amount of soil. When I say the right amount of soil, a soil is not compact, but the soil that's a little bit loose. They found out that if this tree is given the right amount of oxygen, water, and soil, the root will actually mimic the structure of the tree itself. So it's actually quite interesting. So whatever the structure of the tree on top will be the same down below in its roots. You know, Bible speaks of, so these roots can actually get big, long, and deep. So the Bible speaks of three basic root problems that can allow all sin into our hearts. Let's turn our Bibles. Otherwise, there's no point in being in church if we don't have your Bible and turn it. So turn to 1 John chapter 2. It is actually a memory verse. You guys probably know it by heart, but let's still continue to read our Bibles. 1 John chapter 2 in verse 15. I asked you guys to turn, but I wasn't turning. Forgive me for that. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It's a familiar verse. says this, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Brethren, here we go. There are three things that I want you to know about this. There's three, all of our sins, basically, in the manifestation of our flesh is, is comp- and encompassed in all these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Yeah. Now, here's the thing, too. If you read that verse 15, I myself, when I was reading this, this, this thing, I found out that how did these root problems came to me? How is it that I have these root problems? Yeah. Actually, it is when we were in love with the world. In love with the world. You know, when we're in love, we don't want to hear reason, right? You're so focused into the, like, oh, that that, that beautiful lady, you know? You can't even, like, your dad's telling you, like, son, don't be home. Don't be home late. Be be home at 10 o'clock. That is 10.01. (laughs) Broke a little bit of rules, right? You don't hear reason. You don't want to even hear preaching about it, though, right? You don't even want to... Uh, you don't want to heed to the word of God, take heed to the word of God, because you are so in love with the world. Let me tell you, I was very much in love with the world, and many of my roots were from my worldly days. I got saved at the age of 33, and that's 33 years of being in this world. Filthy, as can be. So when I got saved, I'm not kidding, I was crying like a baby. Crying like a baby to Enoch. Enoch would probably say, oh, this not what's coming out. I was like, Lord, I, I'm thankful that somebody saved me. Somebody loved me enough to do this for me. And I praise God for that. But you know what? Unbeknownst to you, I have almost died many, many times in my life. I know of three. 
I got mugged when I was 17 back in the Philippines. There was an ice pick on my, on my back. I was coming home from college, and I had an ice pick on my back, and the guy said, give me your wallet. So I froze. So I'm like this. I'm going to die tonight. I didn't die that night. I'm still here. Right? I got mugged. I gave him my wallet. And then he ran. I praise God he ran. And then I ran after him. I said, give me some money to get home. <laughs> I don't want to walk home. <laughs> he was faster than me, so that's good. Okay? So I still got home. I found means to do that. Here's the other thing, too. I almost died at the age of nine, 18 when uh, I had a collapsed lung. collapsed lung. It's a long story. Collapsed lung, and I was in the ICU for three days. I could have died, and I could have, without Christ, I would have been in hell. And then I was 24 here, and I was driving my little Tercel, and then this big Brinks truck just sideswipes me. I thought my car was just going to flip over and over and over, but it just, like, fishtailed. I'm like, thank you, Lord. <laughs> Still alive. Those were just the, the, the times that I know I almost died. How about the things that God hasn't revealed to me that I almost died? Son, I've been watching over you. I want you to get saved. But that's the world. I'm talking about that. If God did not save me from my sins, I don't know where I'd be. But the world that I was in before causes three problems. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life, which is the summary of all the root problems of our sins. In Galatians chapter 5, it says this. It mentions all the works of the flesh that manifests meaning it has surface streaks. These things are visible, and they are. Which are these? Adultery. Mm, that's, that's pretty obvious. Fornication. Uncleanness. Lasciviousness. Idolatry. Witchcraft, which we know is rebellion. Hatred. Variance, which means quarrels and disagreements. Emulations. Wrath. Strife. Seditions. Heresies. Envyings. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings. I had to look up reveling, so I'm like, what is reveling? Basically, it says noisy, noisy partying, wild celebrations, and carousing. And it says, and such like, which you can include what? Bitterness, disobedience, and selfishness. We see these manifestation in a surface tree that is basically into three basic roots. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The real problem, my brethren, is that with the Bible is not because they don't understand the Bible. The real problem, brethren, is the simplicity of the Bible. It is so simple that it's hard for people to admit and it's hard for people to commit. You know, think about this. When I, when I witness to people, think about the idea of, are you a sinner? Yes. How do you know you're a sinner? That's based on God's Ten Commandments. It's holy law. Then based on God's standards, if, where do you deserve to go? Heaven or hell when you die? Simple. Hell then don't we need a Savior? Simple. But it's hard to admit. How about this, the gospel? Someone loved you and me enough to come down from heaven to earth to die, to suffer on the cross, to die for our sins according to scriptures and rise from the dead. It may be hard to fathom, but God, that's not hard for God. But in, in my mind, that's simple also. The gospel is so simple. Well, what I'm telling you today is simple also. We have a surface tree. There are roots in the bottom. The real problem is we got to address it. Now, if you go to the world about your root problem, here's what the world will tell you. You will probably encounter an atheist. And what will the atheist tell you? Ah, there is no root. You have no problem. Why? Because there's no God. To them, there is no God, so that, which means you have no root and you have no problem. But you know what? They are bent on believing that they actually came from monkeys. Go figure. You will meet a liberal, and this liberal will tell you, Donnie, just cut the tree down. As long as you don't see the roots, you're good. As long as you look good in public, you're good. What are you doing? You're ignoring the problem. How about this? What if you meet a worldly person? Oh, I love this. A worldly person will tell you, fertilize the problem. Okay? Nowadays, good is evil. Evil is good anyway, right? It's so backwards now. What are you doing? You're exacerbating the root problem. Now, we can ignore the problem. We can say there's no problem. We can even exacerbate our problem. But here's the thing. God said, remove the problem. Say thou, thus saith the Lord, and this is in Ezekiel, shall it prosper? Shall he not pull up the roots thereof and cut off the fruit thereof, that it wither? 
It shall wither in all the leaves of her spring, even without great power or many people to pluck it up by the root thereof. The key is to be hooked on the right root. Jesus said in John 15, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch, that's us, cannot bear fruit of itself except it ab abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. Another take of this message, abide in Christ. Okay? Christ is our redemption. Christ is our true vine. But before we can hook onto the true vine, we've got to deal with the root of our problem. And I know I've been like, okay, here's, here's the thing. I'm going to give you tips on how to remove the roots. We're finally going to get to the message. Okay? The tips on removing the roots. It is actually quite, quite very labor intensive. I looked it up online. You know, everything's so right on the internet, right? Everything's correct on the internet. So I looked up, how do you pull up roots? Right? So there are four steps, actually. You gotta trench around, let's pretend this is a tree. You gotta trench around this tree. Meaning you gotta dig around the tree. And while you're digging around the tree, step two will be cutting roots that you encounter. So if there are roots that are running down and you think they need to be removed, you gotta remove them, otherwise you won't be able to trench all the way around. So you gotta remove. So step two will be removing or cutting some, uh, there we go, where was I? Cutting, uh, Cutting the roots as you trench. Now the third step. So after you've trenched it out and you've cut all the roots that in your trench, here's the part. Part three, or step three. You have to remove the root ball. So it's going to be like a big ball of root. Right? Because you've cut the rest of it. Once you've done that, you'll have a big hole in your yard. You'll have a big hole in your Christian life. Right? So put some new soil in it. So here we go. Step number one, trenching around. And I told you, it involves digging, digging, digging. Dig as many Bible verses as you can find about your root problem. You can do no better than finding about what does God say about this and meditate on the word of God. Let me tell you, that's the best thing you can do. Don't go to the worldly person. Don't go to the atheist. Don't go to any of those persons. Go to God. Why is it that when we have problems, who do we go to? People that would support us. Because we want people to support what we want to do in sin? It's true. Believe me, I've, I've done it. I've done it. You know, people have done it. Every time I counsel people, it's always that. How come you didn't come to me first? How come you went to him or her first? Oh, I, got, I get it. You needed support. <laughs> You need to support. Dig as many verses as you want. You know that the Word of God in Hebrews chapter 4.12 says it's quick and alive. Quick it means alive. Quick and powerful. The Word of God is alive, my brethren. The Word still saves. Amen. Doug Gore is the best example of that. I'm, I'm telling you, the day I find out that, that he got saved, I was um, in my office. I, I had to kneel down and praise God for that. Amen. How do you know the word of God is real? He's saving souls even in 2017. Yes, sir. I got saved in 20, 2007. I've been a Christian now for 10 years. Praise God. But the word of God is alive and the word of God is powerful. It still transforms lives. If you guys knew me before I got saved, you would probably say, I'm not going to invite Brother Donnie to any of my parties. It's just who I was. I cursed like... They say sailors. <laughs> That's one of the easiest things for me to get rid of. Cursing. I don't have to do that. When I played ball, I used to curse a lot. It was so stupid. But now I see it like my mistakes and all the sinfulness in my life. But while you're doing it, you don't do it. You don't see the sinfulness. But dig, dig, and dig for the Word of God and meditate on the Word of, of God. And here's what you need to do. Live what you believe. That's worship to God. If you want to worship God, Stop the CCM. Obey the word of God. I like Pastor, Smith verse, Pastor Smith's verse, and I'm sad that he's not here tonight. His favorite verse is, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Let's try to live that verse. Try to hide the word of God in our hearts. So step one is to trench around and dig. Step two is to cut the roots, right? We're supposed to cut the roots while we're trenching. What we're doing basically is to eliminate or remove the things in our lives that causes us to sin. 
Some of these root problems have root issues. So we need to remove these things. So if it is your cell phone that's causing you a problem, you know what you need to do with your cell phone? Just chuck it. Sorry, it's easy for me to say because I don't have a cell phone, right? <laughs> Donnie, it's easy for you to say. One, one guy at work called me, um, I live, he says, I, 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 I forgot what he, he called me. He's like, do you have an outhouse? I said, yeah, I think I do. <laughs> like I live in the dark ages type of thing. I don't even have a cell phone. How does your family get a hold of you? Uh, landline, phone, <laughs> you know, right? So like, and they laugh at me, how come? You know, I've been offered positions at my work to be a, a, a be, be one of the bosses, but I declined it because I know I'd have to have a cell phone. Be a consultant. I said, no, because I have to have a cell phone. I want my eight to five job and go home with my family. I have two girls to train up, in the ch train up your child in the way you should go. And I take that, and I take that really seriously. Amen. I really do. But here's the thing that I'm saying here, is that we are supposed to be removing the root problem. So if it's television, take it out. Get basic if you have to have television. How about computer? Don't get internet. <laughs> internet is evil. I'm telling you that right now. But money, if money is your problem, don't worry about it. Give it to me. <laughs> Pockets all open. All right? Just give it to me, though. I was an accountant. I can definitely budget your money. Starve the flesh, brothers and sisters, so your spirit can grow. The Bible says in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh, here we go, lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that you would. If you think you can co-mingle the words of God and rock and roll music, what are you doing? You are fooling yourself. There's no such thing. Consider Hezekiah in 2 Kings. You guys know Hezekiah, right? If you don't know, that's fine. What did Hezekiah do? He was famous, because he, what did he break? He broke, he cut down the groves, he broke the images, he, he, even, uh, he even broke the brazen serpent. The brazen serpent. He broke it in pieces. Why? Because Israel was actually using us an idol. They were burning incense to it. What did he do? He took down the brazen serpent and broke it. Consider that. Start cutting roots. You know your roots. I know mine. Start working on it today. Don't say, I'll work on it when I'm 50. I'll work on it when I'm 60. When I'm a mature Christian, when I, became, when I become a pastor, I'll work on it. No. Work on it tonight. Amen. If it's spoken in your heart tonight, work on it though. Yeah. So we can have a revival. Yeah. I want to praise God if we do have a revival. Step three. Now here's the part. Now we have to remove the root ball. Now this thing takes experience and strength. Why don't you turn with me please in uh, Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11. And in verse 28. Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 says this, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I like that verse. And the reason why I like that verse, Jesus said, come to him as you are. He did not say, come to me when you are clean. Come to me, like right now. Next thing he asked him, yoke with me, for I am meek and lowly. And learn of me, yoke with Christ. And when you do that, he will carry the load for you. Amen. I like the example of the footprints in the sand, right? We murmur, we complain, we say, God, where are you with all these footprints? I'm walking on my, my own. God said, son, those are mine. God's mine. I have you in my arms. Right? Praise God for that. Remember, it is a spiritual ba battle, my brothers and sisters. Don't punch the air and say, you know what, I'm Manny Pacquiao. I'm punching Satan in the air. That's not how you fight the spiritual battle. How do you fight a spiritual battle? Word of God. Amen. You need spiritual tools. You need the armor of God. Read your Bible. <laughs> Read your Bible. 
Don't punch the air thinking you can do that. That's not how you fight spiritually. Also get a mentor to be able to remove the root ball. God will carry you through. I understand that. The word of God will carry you, carry, carry you through. I understand that. But get a mentor. Get someone that is experienced. Someone that has had experience in what you're dealing with in your specific route. Someone who can tell you what to do, what not to do, and avoid the landmines in our lives. You know, there's one of the things I teach my children. It's like, son, I don't have a son. Daughter. <laughs> Sorry, I've been reading Proverbs lately. My son, my son. But daughter, there's a line mine. Don't step on it. You can actually use my wisdom from the word of God and avoid these landmines. That's what we as parents should be doing to our kids every day. Amen. Honey, how are you today? Are you in a landmine right now? Are you about to step on it and about to explode? No, no, don't do that. Let me help you. Man, get a mentor. Pastor is a wealth of information. You go in there in his office and you get more than what you ask for. <laughs> That's why I called him meaty. That's why I said he's a meaty. I call him Pastor Meaty. Because all his messages are very meaty. And I love it. It's like my paper is always like a lot. I'm scribbling everywhere. I'm like, there's so much, Pastor. <laughs> in one preaching, is so much. But I love that. I love that. And you need to. As a nurse... I don't like it when an immature or an inexperienced nurse will be training a new nurse coming on. By the way, congratulations, Brother Mario. So I don't want any inexperienced nurse to be training Brother Mario. I don't want that. Because an inexperienced nurse will, give, will show him how to cut corners. will show him bad habits. No, no. Me as a nurse, I want an experienced nurse, a mature nurse, and a nurse who loves to train. So no cutting corners. Why? Because we're dealing with lives. And guess what, folks? We're Christians. We're dealing with lives. And the lives we deal with matters heaven or hell. And you know, another way to experience the love of God is through the brethren anyway. So when you get a mentor and you feel the love of God, I hope you praise God for that. Step four is putting in new soil. Uh, this, is, this is another cool part. So now we're on to step four. We're almost done, folks. The clock is wrong. The clock is right. My eyes is not right. Forgive me for that. But step four is putting in new soil. After the root has been taken out, there will be a big hole or void in your ground. Same thing in your life. What if you don't go to parties anymore? What if you don't go drinking anymore? What if you're already sober all the time? That's a big hole. Read your Bible. <laughs> right? right? You have so much time. You got to fill your time with something else. You know, Paul in 2 Timothy, he was teaching him in verse 11 to flee youthful lust. But after you flee youthful lust, you ought to replace it with something. And he says this, I want you to follow after four things. Righteousness, faith, charity, and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. With them. That's you and me. With this group of people. There's no better group out there. God wants us to fill the hole in our lives with new soil so it can grow and grow and grow some hundredfold, some sixtyfold. God can use you when there's new and proper soil in our hearts. The last thing you want is to fill it with another root problem. Oh, say, oh, I was addicted to pornography. You know what I'm going to do now? I'm going to be addicted to drugs. <laughs> That's counterproductive. Well, it's an addiction problem, basically, right? Can't do that. Fill your time with godliness. And I love saying that. Fill your time with godliness. You cannot replace your root problem with another problem. And my coworkers think sometimes that I have a big hole in my life. They think that I have a very boring life. <laughs> they really think that. They think because I don't go smoking with them outside in the patio. Which, by the way, I have asthma. <laughs> I can't do that. They think because I don't go to parties with them that, you know, like, 
because there's booze. I said, I don't want to go to any of your parties, okay? Because I don't fellowship with them. I fellowship with you folks. They want to go out and drink. I said, I don't do that, okay? They want to go to Vegas and hang out and gamble. I said, I, I'm sorry, I don't do that. They think that all I do, all, all day long I do is read my Bible, uh, uh, go to church, and go to Bible study. I'm glad I can do those things. I don't know about you. There's no better work out there than the ministry that we have for God. Yes, I love my work as a nurse. But nothing I love more than being a Christian. I work with God. He helps me. He enables me to be in the ministry. Paul said, I thank him for that. And I thank God for that. Here's the thing. Serving God has been such a privilege and an adventure for me. Very much so. Following righteousness, faith, and charity, and peace with all of you. And it's been such a blessing. You know, I've been reading my Bible now for 10 years every night. I figured if this is the word of God, there's no way I should miss it. I don't think you should too. Live what you believe. If you believe it, live it. You know, we go to Wednesday prayer meetings. We can bring our petitions over. I love that. I love that. Thursdays, I actually hold Bible studies on my sister, helping to disciple my family, my sister and her family. I, love, I enjoy it though, especially when she cooks. I love the youth work. I am proud to say I am a youth worker. But I am down in the trenches because I am with every single one of our youth. And that's how we mentor each and every single one of them. But I love it with a lot of work and a lot of prayer. So discipling the youth is also another priority. How about being in the choir? Oh, I love being in the choir. I really do. I hope we have another special so we can come on 4 o'clock, 4.30, so we can have practices again. I do, I do miss that, Brother Mike. I'm sorry. I'm just saying that. I do miss that. How about passing tracks on, on every month? That's why on Saturday. And I've been wanting to get like a couple of the kids in, like Joshua and Andrew, to, to show them how we can talk to people about Christ. Show them the ropes. I love that. When we meet an unbeliever, what do we say to them? Brother Bill and Brother Troy are amazing at it. If you want to come here on a Saturday, that's a Bible track, uh, a track distribution day, join them. You'll be on fire. Unbelievable. The, unbelievable. These guys, I love being with them. Okay? So how about training my beautiful children? That's, that's like I said, that's a privilege. How about Friday Bible studies at Enoch's? I love it when he preaches. I miss. He's actually my father in the faith. When he preaches to me, I feel like it's, it, it always hits directly. Like this morning, it always hits directly. I still have a full-time nursing job, but it is actually a place of ministry for me. How about Sunday school? I always study for my Sunday school class, and I love seeing the kids' faces, though. How about occasional preaching, like tonight? Teresa even started her young women prayer group. I'm like, I love that. I was a part of that last Friday, and they are a blessing to me. Praise God for His grace. I also have a beautiful wife who supports me all the way. But look at my life. It is rid of the worldly things. That is what consumes my life. To be here and to see your faces on Wednesdays, to shake your hand after we're on the choir. I don't know where to go. If I go this way, I will miss some of these people. If I go that way, you know, I, I'll miss, if I go this way, I'll miss them. If I go this way, I'll miss you. Like, I don't want to miss everybody. I want to shake everybody's hand. And it's, it's a privilege for me. I don't know if you see that. I really, truly enjoy that. And if you hear me singing, because I really have true joy. There's plenty to fill our time with godliness to avoid the worldliness. And that will end our message, but my message, but here we go. In one of Eggie's morning devotions, I forgot to say this, I also have a privilege of, of emailing uh, a few of the youth every morning at work, having a morning devotion with them. I love it. I give them challenges of what we're supposed to do, deny yourself today type of thing, do something nice to someone, be Christ, you know, those kind of things. And they would email me back and say, I've done this, or I did that. And I'm like, it's such a privilege. But Eggie is part of that. And one day she emailed me this, and this I will close. In one of Eggie's morning devotions, she mentioned this. You will have an amazing, an amazing life story without root problems if you let God be the author of your life. If you let God be the author of your life. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it is a privilege, Lord, to serve Thee. I want to thank You, Lord, from the bottom of my heart, Lord, that You did not let me perish. You did not let me, Lord, just be a worldly person out there. I know, Lord, when I look at my life, I know that I rejected you many times in my life. And I look back at that and say, Lord, yet you did not consume me in all of that. I am still here, Father, and I'm thanking and praising you. You save a wretched soul like mine. But because of my worldliness, Father, I have so much roots. I have so much roots, Father, and I'm only taking off the surface trees. Lord, if any of us here understand that we are not going to be accomplishing much if we're just taking down, taking down trees, but we need to be taking down the root, taking out the root. Lord, if you spoke to our hearts today, I pray that you would move your people, Lord, to the altar. Have a face time with you, Father. I want to do that right now, Lord, and I am doing that right now, but Father, I want to praise you. Lord, you keep me every day, and I thank you for that. I want to thank you dearly, Lord, for your Bible. Without it, Lord, I would not know what your will is in my life. But I want to thank you for this opportunity that you have given. We love you. We praise you, Lord. And please keep these doors open, Father, that we may continue to hear thy precious word. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.